All right, it's another Wednesday morning, and that means that we have another sermon to share. The message I have for you today was preached by Dr. G.B. Vick back in 1962, and it is entitled Vision. Vision, I hope it will be a blessing to you here this morning. It's right about 30 minutes long, so sit back and enjoy this message by Dr. G.B. Vick. The Word of God tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Therefore, how much today do we need our eyes anointed with the eye salve of the Spirit of God in order that we might lift up our eyes onto the fields which are white already to the harvest? knowing that the harvest indeed is plenteous, but the laborers are few. God has vouchsafed to his servants, the various writers of Old and New Testament, certain visions to pass on to his people. Both in the Old and New Testament, these visions given by God to those men who were to set them down for the admonition for the instruction in righteousness of all future generations. And we'll call your attention to just a few of these this morning. First, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, an Old Testament vision. There the young prophet, who later became the premier, the outstanding prophet of all the Old Testament, saw a vision of the Lord. Isaiah 6, starting with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Notice that Uzziah was the king who reigned for more than 70 years upon the throne of Israel. But finally, even that man whose life had lasted so long and whose reign had been blessed of God so greatly, that man must come to his end. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Isaiah, in these opening words, seem to indicate to us that the man who lives longest, his life is but as a narrow span between two eternities. And our lives are but as the vapor of the morning. In the morning it's seen, and when the sun comes up, that vapor is dissipated and melts before the rising sun. Isaiah tells us elsewhere that our life is like a flower of the field. In the morning it groweth up and flourisheth. In the evening it is withered and is cut down. And so he's telling us of the brevity of life, of the uncertainty of human life. Even the man like King Isaiah that lives the longest, he said, must come to that time when he'll make his exit from this world and go out into eternity to meet God there to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And so he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw another king who will never die. I saw the Lord high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. First, Isaiah saw the Lord in that vision. Next, he saw himself. Verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwelt in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw the Lord, then he saw himself. My friends, when he saw himself in the light of the effulgent glory and perfection of the king seated upon his throne, high and lifted up in all his glory. That was when Isaiah realized that he was undone, that he was a man who had no human merit to boast of, that he was a man devoid of anything that would commend him to God. And therefore, in the light of the beauty of God's holiness, he sees his own sin and imperfection. Long time ago, I found out the man who lives closest to Christ, who gets closest to him, realizes more keenly his own insufficiency, his own weakness, his own lack of human merit. And so Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, then next he saw himself. And he cried, I'm a man of unclean lips. Then after he saw the Lord and saw himself, he looked upon a needy people, 
His vision was extended and he saw a people going astray like sheep. A people who needed only that which a holy and righteous God could supply. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then the angel from the throne of heaven came with tongues and he took a blazing coal from off the altar of heaven. Verse 7 says, He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, send me. And so, my friends, in this, perhaps the greatest of all of the visions which God had vouchsafed to his holy prophets up to this time in the sacred record, Isaiah gets that threefold vision, how we need today to have an enlarged vision. First, to realize anew the mighty and majesty and the glory and the power and purity of our King seated yonder in the heavens, high and lifted up. Then how we need to see ourselves, who when we've done our best are still but unprofitable servants. How we need to see our own inabilities, our own weakness. How that we are but for the grace of God lost, eternally lost, hopeless, helpless sinners. But when God's grace is exercised, when God devises a way to bring guilty sinners worthy of death, condemned by the law unto himself then we need to see our own unworthiness, but our standing before God, what grace hath made us. Then we need to see a needy world. That's the reason for the mission offering in which we are presently engaged. That's the reason why this church is perennially a great missionary church. That's the reason why at this time of each year, now for some 19 years past, we've bent every energy we've concentrated upon giving the gospel unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So my friends, we need to see a guilty, wicked world lost without God, without hope in this world or in the world to come. May God grant it to us that vision. Then way over in the New Testament, at the latter part of the New Testament, we see another vision which John the seer upon the Isle of Patmos received at the very outset of the book of the Revelation. In chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, John, who had been exiled to that lonely, barren island in the Aegean Sea for the sake of the gospel, <coughs> because of his uncompromising testimony to the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, John said, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle which is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Notice that. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He didn't say I was tracing around on the highways of the country on weekends visiting Aunt Susie and Uncle John eating big dinners on the Lord's day in family gatherings when I should have been at the house of God. He didn't say I was out hunting like a lot of backslidden Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians are in the hunting season, absenting themselves from the house of God and thus incurring the displeasure and the frown of heaven upon them. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. They're the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Greek was the language of culture and refinement. Jesus was here saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Of course, it was the Lord speaking from the glory to his tired, lonely servant exiled upon that little rocky island. John hadn't heard that voice now for more than a half a century of time. The last time John had heard that voice, which spake as never man did, 
John was, had been a young man then. He had stood in that little company of 120 disciples upon the crest of Mount Olivet when Jesus gave unto them and unto us the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When Jesus had said, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach or disciple, make followers of Christ out from among the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world or the end of the age. Amen. Those were the last words that John had heard from the lips of this one who was now speaking from the glory world. Just immediately after Jesus had, gave, had given unto his disciples this great commission, his feet left the crest of Mount Olivet, and he was taken up into the heavens, back to the right hand of the majesty on high, where he'd now been interceding for John and for the rest of us for over this half century of time. John said, I heard that voice. Certainly he recognized that voice, the accents, the intonations, the inflections of that voice. I imagine that John had dreamed of Jesus many times in this intervening half century. Now he hears him speaking, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. One well, of the very first words which came from the lips of the glorified Christ would also make him recognizable by John, by one who knew him as John did. For Je Jesus had said, I am the great I am. Jesus had said in the hearing of John many times in days past, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. I am the vine, ye are the branches. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so Jesus, the great I am, the personal God, the ever-present God, the one with whom there are no yesterdays, todays, or tomorrows, the ever-present, ever-living Christ, he was the one whose voice John recognized so quickly and whose phraseology even was so familiar when he said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am all that there is, the first and the last of all of culture and refinement. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And my friends, that voice was the incarnate word. And being turned, John sees this vision of the glorified Savior. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And you remember that in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. John sees the Christ. Where did he see him? Where you'd naturally expect Christ to be seen. He's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And according to the interpretation given in the last verse of this chapter, the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. And my friends, I say that's where you might expect to see Jesus. Walking not out in the paths of sin, not walking in the busy marts of trade. He cares little for those things that will pass away when this old world is melted with fervent heat and is burned to a cinder. You see him not in some human organization, not in some lodge, but you see Jesus walking in the midst of his churches. And he said his head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow. That speaks of the purity, the perfect purity of the undefiled, glorified Savior. Not only so, but it, see, it pictures him as the Ancient of Days, the one who said before Abraham was, I am. He said, I saw him and the hair of his head was white as wool, as white as snow. And he said, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Nothing hid from the searching, all-seeing eye of the omniscient Christ of God. Men may hide many of their sins 
from the eyes of their fellow human beings, from wife or husband, from loved ones, from friends, from the neighbors perhaps. But my friends, there's not one single deed perpetrated under the shadows of midnight darkness or in the remotest corner of the globe that the all-seeing eye of God which runneth to and fro throughout the whole earth does not observe and does not take note. And so his eyes, which were as a flame of fire, speaks of the all-knowledge, the omniscience of the glorified Savior. And he said, not only so, but his feet were as fine brass as if they'd been burned in a furnace. My friends, brass in Scripture symbolism speaks of judgment. Jesus' feet were as of fine brass as if they'd been burned in a furnace. That speaks of Jesus who bore the judgment which we deserved, who in his own body bore our sins on the tree, the one who was our substitute, who took our place, the one who walked through the furnace of the affliction and the judgment of Almighty God. His feet were as fine brass as if they'd been burned in a furnace. And it says he held in his right hand the seven stars. And the seven stars were the messengers or the angels, we would say in present day phraseology, the pastors of the seven churches. You know, my friends, I like to think that the pastors of the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ are held not by human ingenuity or upheld not merely by the loyal support of God's redeemed and blood-washed people, but that the pastors, those who are true messengers of the Word of God, those who stand true in this day of apostasy and in all days are safe held in the keeping of the omnipotent right hand of God on high. I recognize the fact that throughout the Scripture, all believers are typified by the stars. Daniel 12, 3 says, And they that be wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn men into righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And so in that particular place and in others, the stars are typical of all believers. But yet I think I do no violence to Scripture when we see here the pastors, the messengers of the seven churches in a peculiar way are upheld by the strong omnipotent arm of the glorified Christ as he sits yonder at the right hand of the Father on high. I love to think when wars and when tumults and when the winds of an adverse demon-controlled world sweep around us, that those who remain true to the old book, the faithful witnesses to the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, are held safe in the hands of that omnipotent, glorified Savior. And then he said, I received a message. That message from Christ was to write the things which thou see in a book. And my friends, the whole book of the Revelation is the result of this New Testament vision, the vision of the glorified Savior which John had. Now one other vision. There are other visions in the book of God, I say, concerning His majesty, His purity, His holiness, like He gave to Isaiah. But the only, or at least I should say, the clearest cut vision of the suffering Savior which was vouchsafed to any seer or prophet in all the annals of time and in all the books of God, that vision is portrayed and recorded in the familiar 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah here says, It seems though I shout my voice hoarse, Though I do my best to warn the men of my day and generation, yet it seems that the people are stampeding like cattle, pell-mell on the road to hell. Sometimes in our humanity, we would be tempted to say, what's the use? But my friends, Isaiah, when he saw this vision of the suffering Savior, not the glorified king upon the throne, not even the one who walks among his churches directing their affairs, and upholding by the strong arm of his might, his faithful messengers. 
But here he sees a suffering Savior. And my friend, this vision perhaps is more needful and more personal to every hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner on earth than any other vision recorded in the book of God. Verse 2, this record, this vision of the suffering Savior. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, my friends, that speaks of the miraculous virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who would expect a root to shoot forth out of a dry desert land? Who would expect, who could normally, logically expect to see any vegetation growing up through the desert sands? And yet, my friends, the birth of Christ was one which was supernatural, one which could not be expected from a human standpoint, unlike any other birth, any other generation known to man, the unique birth of the Son of God, when the power of the highest overshadowed a pure spotless virgin, so that that one whom she brought forth was the Son of God, and God the Son, that which was contrary to nature, that which was not to be expected by human wisdom or human reasoning. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. Now he comes right down to the heart of the gospel. This whole vision is John 3.16 in embryo. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Oh, but somebody said, isn't that contradictory to other portions of Scripture? Elsewhere, isn't he referred to as the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the fairest among 10,000, the one altogether lovely? Yes, he is. But my friends, there is no contradiction. For those things speak of his perfect divine attributes, the majesty of his glorious perfections. But wait a minute. Isaiah here, in the vision of the suffering Savior, sees him some 700 years aforetime as he hung yonder upon the cross dying for our sins. And he says when we see him, his face is marred more than that of any man. When we see him, he's hardly recognizable as a human being so blurred and so marred were his features as he suffered there, paying the sin debt of all mankind. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. My friends, you can look upon the sin and the crime, the degradation and the indifference which is manifested by the great mass of hell-bound humanity on every side. And you can know that Isaiah's words were not directed merely to the people of his generation and day, but they're just as true today as ever. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid it where our faces from him. We wouldn't turn our faces to him. We wouldn't look with the eye of faith to him as the fountain source of all of our hopes of salvation. We hid it where our faces from him. We turned our backs upon him and went after the pursuit of pleasure and our worth, worldly, earthly fame and gain. We hid it where our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He wasn't suffering, hanging there upon the cross for any fault of his own. But every sin of which Beecham Vick has ever been guilty was included and helped to nail him on that cross. Every sin which has stained your guilty soul and your careless life, helped to nail him and impale him upon that old rugged cross. But he was wounded for our transgressions. It was Christ the Lord bearing our sins upon his own body on the tree. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, not just the red light district, not just those on Skid Row, the up and outs as well as the down and outs, 
The people who are, dis, who are refined and respected citizens in the community are just as guilty by their pride and their self-righteousness of nailing to the cross as is the staggering, muttering, vomiting drunkard down on lower Michigan Avenue. For all we like sheep, there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a righteous man upon the earth and one that doeth good and sinneth not. My friend out there, I want to emphasize again that you, if you're self-righteous and cocky and proud of your own standing and of your respectability, you by your own self-righteousness and pride are just as guilty of nailing the Son of God yonder to the cross as were those who drove the spikes through the palms of his hand and pierced his side with a spear. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to a slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his souls. He'll see the fruitage of his suffering on the cross. It ever redeemed soul down through the ages. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now, my friends, this vision of the suffering Savior dying there when God made the soul of his own son a sin offering. This ought to induce us to heed the message, the exhortation which follows. Hard after, over in the 54th chapter, verse 2. What are we to do in the light of Calvary? How do we requite such love and such mercy undeserved, such matchless, marvelous grace? Over in verse 2 of chapter 54, enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtain of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. In other words, he says to Christians who look to the cross as their hopes of salvation, who are depending upon the substitutionary atoning, vicarious death of Christ upon that cross. He said, what are you going to do about it? Let your life, let your whole tenor of your days Live out your gratitude to the suffering Savior who plucked you as a brand the burning. Don't be satisfied with present attainments. You're to be witnesses unto him, to bring souls to him, to bear fruit unto him. He said, I've ordained that you go and bring forth fruit, much fruit. And so, my friends, we're not to be satisfied with present attainments. We're not to be satisfied with what we have done or what we are doing, but rather God here in the light of Calvary is exhorting us through the inspired pen of Isaiah to lengthen the cords, to strengthen the stakes, to enlarge the place of our habitation, to break forth on the right hand and on the left. That is our duty. In the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, we see our hope for Christ and Calvary and the redemptive work wrought thereon is the basis of our hopes of salvation. In Isaiah 53, we see our hope. In Isaiah 54, we see our duty to be faithful unto death to the Christ who bought us and who loved us, who washed us from our sins in his own body upon the tree. Our duty individually to witness, to win souls, not to live for self, but to live for Christ. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That's our duty in the light of Calvary. Now, as we saw our hope in Isaiah 53, our duty in Isaiah 54, we see in the opening verses of 50, Isaiah 55, we see our message. For we do have a message to show to the nations. 